I had to pee so bad after the movie. This is Harrison Ford cosplaying as Amish. Okay, all right. Good God. Howdy, y'all. It's your boy, Nate. I read books because reading is sexy, and if you're not reading, you're not sexy. February, so fast. That was crazy, y'all. February was a bit wonky for me, but yeah, gonna do a quick February reading wrap-up. 14 books for February, which isn't too bad. Most of it was physical reads. Yeah, not any ARCs this month. It's kind of crazy. Usually there's an ARC or two, but as always, these will be flash reviews of the books and I will go more in depth with these books in future vlogs. Also, wanted to mention, I'm a proud Blackwell's affiliate. So if you enjoyed any of the books that I will talk about within this video, please consider purchasing the books within the link. I was a big book depository stand, but when it went under, I was like, oh my God, where do I get my books? But for like new books at a reasonable price, Blackwells, Blackwells, and also they offer free shipping, which is like <laughs> godsend when uh, I'm someone who lives in a country where it's like hard to get like current English books within the literary fiction scene. So if you like me and you like the books that I read or not, just like consider purchasing your next read in the link below. It would offer me a bit of a drive to continue going on. Okay, all right. Good God. But okay, first started the month with The Shards by Brett Easton Ellis. I don't have my copy with me because I sold it to the Green Apple in San Francisco for that cash back, you know? Actually store credit, I, I bought another book, which I, We'll talk about later but this was a lot of fun i didn't know how i felt about it at first given its length we get gritty la very horny teens people are dying dropping dead like flies left and right and we're wondering who who is this killer who is this killer though i don't think the whole climax works out very well i thought it was a very fun read and it was actually quite breezy more than expected. I can't wait for the Luca Guadagnino adaptation because I can I can see it. Visually, I can see it. And it definitely will be much more edited, I'm sure, than the book. Uh, I still feel Brett Easton Ellis needs an editor. Like we didn't need all of that, but it was fine because it read really quickly, so it was fine. But yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. Next up, I read Love in the Big City by Park sang Young. At first I didn't enjoy it, given that it was like so pithy and unserious and kind of shallow. But then after upon reflection, I was like, you know what? This is one of those first queer books to hit the market and get global attention. Thanks to Anton Her, great translator. Then I was like, you know what? As much as the gays have so much hurt and pain, we can be unserious. We can have pithy, shallow, romantic flings and dumb fights and it's fine it's fine and i accept the book for what it is now but if you are curious about what the dating scene is like what gay couples argue about within Chongro or itaewon this i think is great look into that it's about basically this uh young gay man who i want to say is a bear i saw a picture of pak on the cover of the book and i was like you know what he's writing himself in okay he's a bear yeah it's about a man dipping in and out of different kinds of relationships, short-term, long-term, and the balancing act of what it means to be queer in modern Seoul. After that, with the money that I got from the Shards, I bought The End of Me by Alfred Hayes, which I also don't have, it's at my LA address, but this is a cute little, that is not cute. You know what? What was this even about? Some of my faves have been talking about Alfred Hayes, Pato, the left-handed reader, and I was like, it's my turn. I, let me dip into his work. I chose the wrong one. This is definitely so left field. It's about a man who leaves home to New York to sort of like hard reset his life. But as he does so, a flood of memories come in, um, what troubles him, and ultimately we find that the past haunts. And 
I couldn't put this book down. I finished it on an hour and a half flight. There's just something eclectic and electric about Hayes's prose that I, I couldn't put the book down. It was stunning in nature. Just the way that he would place words together with like adjectives and nouns I had never like seen before. And sometimes um, like sentence structure, it was just so odd and refreshing in a way. And I know Hayes is also a screenwriter. So just to see sort of um, this like cinematic quality to this story was just entertaining at best. But yeah, perhaps not the best way to start with Hayes, and I'll have to do the other ones eventually um, because I'm really interested now. Really nice, I guess, appetizer or taste test, a sample to what his writing looks like, and I want more. I want more. After that, I did a poetry collection. We did Machete by Tomas Q. Maureen. This looks at what life is in terms of a double-edged knife, a double-edged machete, sort of the pain and power and violence and still nature that life is and what it provides, how quickly things change from the past self to the present self and how they sort of speak to each other. There's a duality, I think, to life when we think of past and present where it doesn't quite offer enough within the future, but perhaps provides questions into how we can move towards a better future in terms of clarity. Enjoyed this quick snappy collection. Then I did another poetry collection. We did Pacific Power and Light by Michael Dickman. This is what it's like to microdose back in suburbia, looking at freshly mowed lawns, the rainbows within sprinklers, and th that's it. Those are the vibes. That's it. It was nice because given that I was home and I'd read this while I was home, I was thinking about like where I was from and who I am now and sort of just the beauty of slow life, the beauty of suburbia. I take it with a, a lot more appreciation now. If that's what you want, if those are the vibes you want, definitely look into this. And then I read the screenplay Maestro by Bradley Cooper and just as entertaining as it is, well, as watching it. With the script, I did get a better sense of who the characters were. Carrie Mulligan's character as well, I really got a sense of who she was. It was really interesting to see the notes, which Bradley Cooper pointed at, like, um, I guess to give focus to uh, what the film should deliver at and for Cooper himself as well. Loved it. I loved the film so much as well. That's why I read it. And I really wanted to get a sense of um, how the characters spoke to each other. Still feels a bit premature in how they speak to each other in terms of like good script writing, but I think Cooper does a very good balancing act of like him being, you know, a director, a producer, actor, and all of these roles for a singular film. And it's quite a titan of a film. And so is Leonard Bernstein. I did this cute little book, French Love Poems, edited by Tanan Kogain. And this is just a collection of love poems, both in one side French and the other side English, of sort of all the poems that you imagine love to be about. All the love poems, when you think about love poems uh, within France. And it's a, it's a cute read. I had fun. Love is landscape. Love is body. Love is touch. Love is feelings. Love is out of those feelings. And then some. And it, yeah, it was just a cute little read. I read it over a layover. Yeah, darling, darling. Definitely something to return to, especially for the month of February. <laughs> Okay, now I can actually hold up some books. Y'all, we finished the trilogy. We did Kudos by Rachel Koss, the last in the trilogy. This was so odd, like as a way to cap off the series. I, I don't know ultimately what to think of it, but I think creates a very nice stepping stone into her greater works, like Second Place. And again, about the idea of masculinity, power, where does power come from? And what does one do with that? Surviving as a woman. Yeah, just very odd. I, I didn't really know what to make of the ending. If anyone didn't, doesn't know, it's basically about this woman. We get her name in the second book, but she goes off again, meeting these people who basically confess intimate parts of their lives to her. But this one is more heavy set within the publishing realm. Women in a man's industry. Where does she belong? What does she do? How does she survive? Like ultimately, when I think of Cusk's work, I really loved Second Place the most because I, I think that's the epitome of great 
cusk. And honestly, I didn't know what to expect because I held off for so long, but finally finished it. Then I did a Mishima. We did Yukio Mishima's Life for Sale. This is so pulpy, so camp, so odd, but it deals with sort of the same questions that Mishima always explores within the meaning of life. What is one to do? What is one's why? Like, why am I here? This is done differently in that it's kind of dark, kind of funny. It's about this guy who wants to unalive himself, uh, fails to do so, so he puts in the paper ads about how he wants to sell his life. And through that, he meets a cast of very strange characters, a vampire even. Through these different people, he doesn't quite understand what life is still, but is sure that life is strange, life is wonderful, and life goes on, uh, no matter how much one wants to end life. But yeah, I, I thought this was entertaining at best, and I did it really for the cover. Like, look at that. Stunning in itself. I have another Mishima on deck somewhere here, and can't wait to do that. After that, I did I did The Tao of Nature by Chuang Tzu, and this has been on my bookshelf for like, I think five years, just as like a coffee table book. And I finally did it. Very much Zen, Buddhist thought, how to center the idea of heaven and what it means. Uh, within the world. Heaven is not something that's far off and beyond, but perhaps something that's uh, seeped deep within the threads of nature, within water, within land. It really is about like how does one center oneself within this idea of heaven, within not perfection per se, but how we settle into ways to create, to make the little imperfections perfect in our own ways so that we can go on living with less despair and less worry and less anxiety. I thought the first half was very strong, and then the last half, with many of the conversations that he was having, especially with like Confucius and Say So, kind of just felt like a senile old man just saying the same thing over and over again, and I was like, okay, enough. Probably something I'll revisit in the future, definitely like the first chapter, um, I think is beautiful. After that, I did Joan Didion, where I was from. Another nonfiction about basically her upbringing, her family, um, how they settled into California, and then very much about the becomings of California, this like poignant part about her mother and her father. And for the most part, I thought this was quite boring. I think it took Didion a long while to figure out what she wanted to say, but California is so massive. I think it's so hard to talk about California. She had a hard start to like where to place herself. Coffee in a paper cup today, y'all. Sorry, waiting for the city sounds to dwindle out. Gotta love it. Let it be known that it is 8.30 in the morning. Okay, I think we're good. <laughs> but yeah, it gets really interesting by the end because it is also a breakdown of her novel Run River, her first novel. She has a ton of notes on where it came from and I really enjoyed that. And with that, she talked a lot about her mother and father, and then it ends. It just ends like that, and I wish she had gone on because there were just beautiful passages about how much her mother meant to her and what she learned from her mother, but very quickly it ends, and I'm just like, oh, if we could just stay there for a little bit longer, this would have been a lot more enjoyable, but I think this is for Didion stands. Like, if you love, love Didion, and if you love California like I do, I think you'll really enjoy this. And... Welcome to today's sponsor, me. Hello, this is my novella. Adolescence Leaves. It is fractured prose between Los Angeles and Tokyo about the reflections of a breakup. It's about loss, it's about memory, all good stuff. If you enjoy me, I think you'll enjoy this. But yes, I'll have a discount code somewhere down below where you can purchase it. And now, I do know that I have these available now as uh, used copies, but the used copies are still in very good condition. They were just used for marketing purposes. There are no dents and such. They just won't be saran wrap. The new editions are saran wrapped and like clean, clean, but for like half off. So y'all, pick it up. It's at a discount. <laughs> How can you not? Anyway, that's me, okay. Then I did a collection of essays on Not Knowing by Emily Ogden, and you know what? I cannot tell you for the life of me what this is about. <laughs> the introduction really tells you about what these essays are. It's about how to deal with not knowing the big unknown and love. But ultimately, I mean, yes, but very, 
vaguely. Each essay begins with a title that has nothing to do with the actual content of the essay. How to have a one night stand. And it does not tell you how to have a one night stand, but very much wish-washy feelings about life, how to deal with it, but in very abstract, pithy ways. What I then later realized is that this is very much like a mood piece. Like if you're just there for the vibes about like the big unknown, I think this is a lot of fun. Like if you don't want to read fiction, but you just want to sort of like swim in prose and then come out feeling like a better version of yourself, super sexy, super smart. This this will do it for you. Cause I did, I definitely did. And something to revisit, I was spacing out <laughs> within how sort of wish-washy the prose was. Cause I, I really can't tell you what this is about. This is what happens. You do things for the cover and this is the end result. Okay, next up I did After Tonight, Everything Will Be Different by Adam Nade. What I didn't know is that before this, Adam had sort of serialized zines surrounding the same themes with this through picture, risograph, and uh, photography. Um, throughout the book, you get these um, sometimes fun visuals that are also collages at times too. But with every chapter, we begin with food. And when we begin with food, we jump into memory, into this guy's life, and we visit sometimes traumatic events, sometimes very special moments in childhood, all in and around his life. And it's really beautiful. There's a humanity in here that's dirty plastic al fresco tables, burritos, tacos, very simple foods as well in San Diego. And I think we get so little of San Diego literature that this was just so special. There's a humanity at heart here that um, is spellbinding. And I couldn't put this down, it was um, enjoyable. Very enjoyable. I finished it within like two days. If you are from San Diego, please pick this up. It is so cute. I was looking at all the places too. I think Taco Stand is mentioned here actually, but like just just seeing it captured in this way is just like really special. Y'all, Indie Sleaze is back. DIY culture is back. It's here. It's wonderful. Okay, last book of the month was a buddy read. I did Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye with your home girl, Modern Ajima. Oh my god, y'all, top read of 2024. I don't know if anything will ever beat this, because like, <sighs> this is Morrison's debut. It's about a girl who wants blue eyes because her whole community, her own family, hate her. They think she's ugly. And Trigger Warnings is about the big R word and how does community, the people around you, circumstance, how do you survive all of that being Black? so rich, it's so angry. It's very much Morrison at her finest. Like you really do see the foundations of where she comes from and what her art is about through this. And it's relentless. Even by the end, I, I just, I was so shattered. Like I was texting Modern Ajima, I was like, I can't pick up another book. Like I feel so still, I'm still reeling from this, but it's like everyone, please pick up Morrison. If you haven't yet, please do this. Like do not be, fooled by its short form factor in the same ways I felt about Sula. This, I think, is just so tremendous. It'll rip your heart apart. And I don't know what else to say other than please read it. But yeah, I want to say it's Morrison at her best too. You really do see her anger. The heart of where her writing comes from really stems from this. Again, really can't wait to read more Morrison. But yes, that's, that's that. Okay, and just real quickly, because we're at 26 minutes, I got my laptop here. Y'all, let me do a quick count of how many movies I watched in February. I watched 41 movies, y'all, in the month of February. Ah! I'm insane, I'm insane. But just to give you some notable ones, I watched I Am Cuba, which is a propagandist film from Russia, but it has these like really sweeping camera movements of Cuba that are just so gorgeous and wrought with so much righteousness and power and beauty in what Cuba is. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. I've not seen anything so striking like that in terms of like cinema as power. That's what it is from 1964. Wonderful. And I watched this little, really cute low key film from last year, I believe called Fremont. It's about an Afghan refugee working at a fortune cookie factory and in sort of like a Jim Jarmusch kind of way, she meets different people, tries to find sort of the settlement of life and how to make her life richer. 
Jeremy Allen White is in the film as well, and he comes in as such a surprise. It's it's wonderful. If you're looking for like a like a very low key film that's like funny and sweet, it's a it's a cute one. Then I watched Shiva Baby from 2020. It's about this Jewish girl, um, and she goes to this family reunion of sorts after someone in the family passes away. So what do you call those? What what do you call that service after a funeral? Anyway, it's that, and through that you get sort of the anxiety of what it is like to be at family gatherings and it, it's just like it just keeps going and going and you're wondering when when everything will explode it's so realistic it's so funny and sharp running time is like very small like 90 minutes or so but um, it never loses pace and it's a lot of fun then i watched one from the heart by francis ford coppola this is out from 1981 and it is so beautiful this is exactly what cinema is some of these crossfades and transitions in terms of like set movement is just so choreographed in a way where it's like it's proof that directors will take life experience extract and cinema can take it make it anything and it's gorgeous i just want to live in this film it's so 80s Vegas. It's really about this man and woman, how they split apart and then find love again. And it's it's really shallow, but just like the film itself, I just like want to live in it. It's definitely like a beautiful comfort film that like I'll just play on in the background and just like want to dip in and out of this world. It's And then finally I watched Turning Red, Pixar's Turning Red. I don't know why I held off for so long, but it was so cute. Uh, just like the animation style and the witty humor and just like growing up as this Asian kid with, you know, dragon mom, kind of grew up with the same experience. Uh, the end is just so, I, I, I teared up, I teared up. And it was, it's really about loving parts of yourself, owning up to it and being okay with it. Ooh, another notable one. I watched Witness from 1985. This is Harrison Ford cosplaying as Amish. And it's, it's a fun crime thriller. Go watch it. Steady pace, beautiful character analytics, as well as cultural differences. How do we move through them? But there's a lot of respect. There's a lot of respect to each character. You get a good sense of who they are. It's a lot of fun. And then last movie of February is Dune, Dune part two. And y'all, I'm sorry, I'm biased. I, I haven't read the books, but like, I just love sitting through a good cinematic masterpiece in terms of story, visualizations, God, like the CG, everything, everything about it is cinema. Go see it in a big ass theater, go see it with a good ass sound system and it's <laughs> chef's kiss, it's amazing. It was amazing. I had a piece so bad after the movie, but it was amazing. I love Timmy and Zendaya, beautiful chemistry going on there. But yeah, it is just so stunning to look at. Like I can already imagine the uh, monograph, uh, like film still monograph, being published soon because like it's oh god it looks so good anyway y'all jesus that was 33 minutes on a bunch of books and films thanks for being here as always i love y'all let me know what you read or watched in february what stuck out to you let me know i love adding things to my queue and as always be well do good work keep in touch mm -hmm.